Ephesians chapter 4, and we began this series, it's the passage of scripture, verses 7 through 16 uh, last week. It's amazing to be part of something that God says he will build. Let that sink in for a moment. You know, Jesus said he will build his church, Amen. and we can be part of that. So it's amazing to be part of something that God says he will build, and then it's even more amazing to see how he says he will do it. Now all we have to do then is follow his recipe. Amen. You ever uh, uh, cook something uh, and, and in the picture, in the recipe book, it just looks amazing. <laughs> and for some reason, when yours comes out, it doesn't look the same. Anybody ever been there and just made? Yeah, the, the one time I tried to cook something, my wife's like, what was that? <laughs> no. Uh, sometimes we may think, I've got a better way. And then sometimes it just doesn't work out. And yet, God tells us specifically that he'll build his church. And we've been looking in the last few chapters, really, on the context of Christ and his church. But now, specifically, how he's going to do that. Last week, we saw in verse number 7 that he gave gifts to men. At the moment of salvation, God gifted every child of God with something to use for him in his church. And, and gifts of grace, nothing we earned or deserve. They were measured by Christ. And, and it's our opportunity now, our job now, to figure out what that gift is and get busy using it for him. If, if we think it's not that important, we miss verses 8 through 10 and, and what God went through so that we could have those gifts. And, and that's what we looked at last week. We ended with verse number 10, and so this morning we're going to pick up verse number 11, 12, and we might even get through verse number 13 as we continue this thought of Christ and his church. Look in Ephesians 4, verse 11, the Bible says, and he gave some. Now, what are we talking about gave? Remember, he gave gifts. Now it's referring to some specific gifts. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There's so much meat in these three verses that we're going to unpack this morning. And as we begin, we're going to have a word of prayer. Again, I ask you to pray and ask the Lord to open your eyes, the eyes of your understanding, as we've seen in chapter 1, be enlightened to his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've enjoyed uh, singing your worship, hearing song, song of your worship, all about you giving, our fellowship that we can have in your church. Lord, this is your day. We don't want to take any glory. We don't want to take any of the light. We turn it all towards you. And as we open your word, we ask that you'd show us, teach us, help us to see what you have and determine to act upon it. Oh, how wonderful it is that you love us. We can get lost in that. The Almighty God loves us. And you have a part for us to play in this life in your church. Help us to see it, find it. Follow it, fulfill it for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse number 11 tells us some specific gifts that God gave to his church. And other services we've looked at over the past couple of years, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, describes certain gifts that God gives people for his church. And, and uh, he's given all of us at least one of those things. And yet this passage is not saying things that he's given to people for the church. This passage is teaching us there are some gifts that God gave to the church. Other things were gifts for men. These are gifted men for the church, to the church. These are not gifts that man has given to the church. These are divine gifts that God has given to his church. And let's see what they are. Verse number 11, and he gave some apostles. There's one. And some prophets. There's two. And some evangelists. There's three. 
and some pastors and teachers, I believe that's clearly referring to the same office. So four different gifted men that God has given to his church. Now let's briefly talk about each one of these and then we're going to see why he gave them in just a moment. The first um, group of men that he gave to his church are apostles. The word apostle means a sent out one. An apostle in scripture is one who witnessed the risen Christ, the resurrected Christ, and then was directly commissioned by Jesus. There were several of them, 12 of them, if you want to be exact, 12 apostles in scripture. The next uh, group of people that he gave to his church, it says, and some prophets. Prophets were ones who were given God's word to proclaim and to record. In Bible times, they didn't have the Bible. That, that's not too deep, right? We understand that. And in Bible times, they didn't have the Bible, right? And so as God is giving his word, he's given it to prophets to give to people, okay? They're, they're recording his word. They're proclaiming his word. In the way that these words are used in this passage, apostles and prophets are no longer on the scene. Now, let me develop that for just a moment. They were used by God to help lay the foundation of the church. We talked about this last week. When Jesus ascended, who came? The Holy Spirit came. And when the Holy Spirit came, it began the, the body of Christ. Jesus is now ascended. He wants to do a work in his church. And so in Acts, the, the, the church began. That's why we're looking at that on Sunday nights, the, the church alive. And he used the apostles and prophets to help lay the foundation. Now, if you're in construction or in, in any kind of building, or if you're not, but have a little understanding of it, you know that the foundation is critical. The foundation will determine the strength and structure of the building, the size of it. The ability of it to withstand. And so there was a foundation that was laid in the apostles and prophets when Jesus left. You'll see in scripture that God even gave those men special miracle working powers. We see that in scripture. Why did he do that? Why did he, why, how were they allowed to do some miracles? It was to authorize and confirm the message. This was an important stage as they laid the foundation. If you were with us a few weeks ago, remember back in chapter 2, verse 20, we saw and are built upon the foundation of who? The apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the foundation was laid in these apostles and prophets for the church. But may I tell you this? When they died, they did not have successors. Now, what do you mean? You don't lay a foundation for a building every few stories. Do we understand that? Some of you are just lost a little bit. Uh, losing the construction uh, jargon. Yeah, there we go. Vernacular. There we go. You know, you lay a foundation once for the building. And God used the apostles and prophets the way he wanted to, to lay that foundation. There are no more apostles and prophets in the way that this word is used in this verse today. Someone tells you I'm an apostle, that they must be thinking of a completely different meaning of the word apostle than what scripture uses here. God does give the gift of prophecy. And yet in the way that he used the apostles and prophets, as it's referring to in Ephesians 4, there are no more of these today. But there are more of certain people in this verse. Let's keep reading. Verse 11, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Who are they? An evangelist is someone who proclaims the gospel to the lost. In one sense of the word, every child of God is an evangelist, should be an evangelist proclaiming the, the word. And yet in this way that it's used in Ephesians 4 in the context of the church, God gifted some specific people to be an evangelist, to preach the gospel specifically to the lost. Sometimes these are missionaries. Sometimes these are certain people stationed in certain churches that their job, their, their role is to win the lost. I had the privilege growing up in a, in a certain church and there was a man that he was called the soul winning pastor there in the church and he won folks to Christ. It seemed like every day. 
And what a wonderful testimony. Undoubtedly, the gift of an evangelist. Sometimes we have evangelists that travel around the country and, and preach in churches and for the sole purpose of bringing the lost and going preach the gospel. God gave gifts to men for the church. An evangelist. And then the last one is a pastor and teacher. A pastor and teacher. The word pastor in scripture means a shepherd. A pastor is a shepherd. Acts 20, 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers that you feed the church of God. This message was given to leaders of the church, which he hath purchased with his, with his own blood. This message, and we're going to see some passages of scripture in just a moment. First Peter 5, 2, feed the flock of God. All throughout scripture, especially the New Testament, God is telling the pastors, feed the flock his flock that he gave his life for, that he died for, that he purchased, that he has gifted pastors to feed. Feed the flock. Now, in the New Testament, we're going to do a little uh, five-minute Bible study and turn to a few places for a moment here because I want you to see this. The word pastor is used interchangeably with two other terms in the New Testament. We see the word pastor is also used as the word elder. The word pastor is also used with the word bishop, all explaining and describing different aspects of the same office. I want you to see it. Go to Acts chapter 20. Because every role, every part of this is important. This is who God has gifted for his church, to his church. Acts chapter 20. If you're with us on Sunday night, several months ago, this is the end of, of Paul's third missionary journey. And he's coming back and and he wants to go by Ephesus, but he knows if I go to Ephesus, I'm not going to leave. I just love those people that that's who he's writing this letter to. And, and I just I've got to get to Jerusalem. I can't go there. I'll tell you what, I'm not going to go there, but send for them to come to me and we'll meet them at the port. OK, that's what verse 17 says. And from my leaders, he sent to Ephesus and called who? The elders of the church. All right, so the next passage of Scripture tells us what he tells the elders. Skip down to verse 28. One thing he told them is, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock. Now, hold on a minute. Who's he talking to? Verse 17 tells us he's talking to the elders, and now he's talking about the flock, the pastors, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you. The next word is overseers, where we get the word bishop, elder, Pastor, same office. What's their role? Look at it. To feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. Turn over, if you would, to Titus chapter 1. I want you to see this in Scripture. What are we seeing? Interchangeably, different descriptions of the same office. Titus chapter 1. Look in verse number 5. The Bible says this, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. There's one role. And ordain elders in every city as I had appointed. There's another. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children. It goes on for a list here. Not accused of right or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-will, not soon angry. What are we seeing here? Pastor, elder, bishop, it's used interchangeably. Let me show you one more place. 1 Peter chapter 5. A few pages over. 1 Peter chapter 5. Look in verse number 1. It says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock. There's the pastor of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. There's the bishop, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Having I mean, go back to Ephesians 4. Hey, Pastor, what are, we, what, what are you showing us in all this? What, what, what does it all mean? There are several different aspects of this office that God points out that are very, very important. A pastor teacher, one that God has given to his church, must fulfill the role of an elder. An elder points to the fact of being a mature man of God, not a novice in the faith. 
He must be a bishop, which is an overseer, a manager, a leader of his church. Hebrews 13, 7. We didn't even turn there. And Hebrews 13, 17 also speaks to that fact. And he's an elder, he's a bishop, he's a pastor, a shepherd, one who cares for, protects, and ultimately feeds the flock. Now, look right up here. That's who God has given to his church. All four of these men, whether they're present now or had a, a role in it, then apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, all four of these have something in common. Do you know what it is? They all center on the word of God. The apostles were there with the living word. The prophets were there to proclaim what had not been revealed yet only revealed to them as they gave the word. The evangelists preached the gospel, the word of God to the lost. The pastors and teachers feed the Christians and feed the flock with God's word. Everything must center on God's word. For today, the evangelists, the pastors, teachers, hear me, do not have their own message. As a pastor, I must be faithful to God's word, not mine. Furthermore, any church is going to be malnourished, anemic, when the word of God is not preached and taught. Even when it's compromised or diminished. When the, God's word is watered down, what results are God's people not being fed. Amen. Instead, they get fluff. Been to the fair before? You ever gotten cotton candy? What's cotton candy? Oh, it looks so good. It's so big. And you take a big chunk and put it in your mouth and it's all gone like that. I mean, it tastes good, but it doesn't satisfy, does it? Why? It's fluff. You know what's unfortunate today? A lot of pastors given fluff. What results? Some people may be motivated or get a little shot in the arm and encouragement for the day, but they're not fed. They walk away and there was an experience, but there wasn't a meal. May I tell you, any pastor that gives fluff is not fulfilling his role as a pastor. Amen. It centers on the word of God. It can't be watered down. Well, if I preach what it says there, there are going to be people that get offended. And so let me say it a little bit different way. Hold on, hold on. Who are you to change God's word? Amen. Well, this is the, the culture of the day. The culture of the day needs God's word. Doesn't need man's opinion of it. And the pastor and teacher, the evangelist, the apostles, the prophets were one that are supposed to give God's word. That's how he set it up to build his church. May I tell you, you may say, Pastor, you've said this often, that you're going to give God's word. You're going to give God's word. I do that for two reasons, one for your sake and one for mine. And here's why. Let's say, unfortunately, months down the road, weeks, weeks, months, years down the road, I get up and read a verse and then we close our Bible and I talk to you for a little while and share and give you some thoughts, something that may encourage you for the day. May I tell you, it's your role and your job to come and say, Pastor, we don't want the fluff. Amen. You're not doing your job. You know, pastors that just give fluff and never hear anything about it, they're wrong for giving the fluff and the church is wrong for accepting the fluff. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, but he's the pastor. He can do what he wants. No, no, no. The pastor's supposed to feed the flock God's word. Amen. And you ought to hold me accountable to that. I ought to be accountable to that as a preacher, to only give God's word. I'm getting a little carried away in verse number 11. Let's go to verse number 12 and see why. That's what God gave. Why did God give it? Verse 12 tells us. Look at the first phrase. For the perfecting of the saints. Look right back up here. A pastor, a teacher is given by God to his church for the purpose of perfecting the saints. The word perfecting means maturing, a complete furnishing. That word is used in other places of scripture when it's referring to even setting a bone. We would understand what that means. Or, or the disciples, they use this same kind of word when they're talking about mending their net. What are we seeing? We're seeing holes here. We're seeing something out of place here. We're seeing this here. And, and a pastor teacher is supposed to feed the saints, perfecting the saints, God's word, so that they become complete, mature. Amen. 
The nets are mended. Bones are set. That's the purpose for the perfecting of the saints. You say, who is a saint? My pastor said it this way. If you're saved, you're a saint. If you're not, then you ain't. Okay, <laughs> That's what a saint is. Some people say, oh, I'm not a saint. I'm a child of God. No, if you're a child of God, if you trusted Jesus, the Bible says you're a saint and we're supposed to be perfected. It is the role, the responsibility, the duty of the pastor, teacher to perfect the saints, to help them grow in their spiritual lives. God uses many different things for all of us to grow. He uses trials. He certainly uses his word. But this passage teaches us that he uses spiritual leadership in his church to help perfect the saints. May I say it this way and hang with me for a moment. It is not the primary responsibility of the pastor to do the work of the ministry. You say, what? Yes, pastors are supposed to do the work of the ministry, but that is not the primary goal, primary role, and primary responsibility. It's the pastor's primary responsibility to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry. If all I do as a pastor is the work of the ministry, and I do this and fulfill this role and do this and do this role, and then I get up here and teach you God's word, and I do this and do that, I'm not fulfilling my role. You know what my primary role is? To feed the flock of God so that they see what God wants in their lives and they put that into practice. Amen. If you're in a church where you're not growing, now pause for a moment. And it's because it's it's not because you don't want to. Some people are in church and they're not growing because they don't want to. They got no desire for it, they just show up just because. But if you're in a church and you've got a desire to grow and a hunger for God's word and you're not growing because you're not being fed God's word, may I tell you, get out of that church. Yes, sir. That's not a church. Amen. Not God's church. And when the saints are perfected, one way that that's measured, one way that we see that is the work of the ministry is done. It's the responsibility of the pastor to help perfect the saints. Look at it in verse number 12. He gave some, we saw verse 11, pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints. Why? For the work of the ministry. There, there are some people that think verse 11 is who he gave to do verse 12. Three things. The pastors and teachers are supposed to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. And that's a wrong interpretation and understanding of this passage. This passage is saying he's given pastors and teachers to perfect the saints to do the work of the ministry so that the body of Christ is edified. Amen. You know, there are too many people today that have the idea that the clergy, there's a word for it. We hire the clergy to perform the work of the ministry. Wrong no, it's wrong. No, yeah, no, no, you're agreeing with me. I'm kidding. <laughs> the clergy is not hired to do the work of the ministry. According to Scripture, God gave gifted men, pastors, and teachers to perfect the saints to do the work of the ministry. Now, I'm, again, I'm not saying that I don't do the work of the ministry. One way to help perfect the saints and to show the saints is to get involved in the work of the ministry and come alongside of and help and let me show and do this. And yet... If I only do that, I'm not fulfilling my role of perfecting saints. I've got to spend time studying, preparing. What? Preparing a meal to feed God's people. The pastor should feed the flock, help them fulfill the use of the spiritual gifts that God has given them. By the way, that's why we have two Sunday morning services. Not for you to come to both, but we want opportunity to feed the flock. That's why, again, we have a Sunday evening service. It's completely different from a Sunday morning. Some people think we have three different services, three different opportunities for you to come. We have two in the morning. It's a completely different one, Sunday night. That's why we have another service on a Thursday night for those that are able to come. That's why we have a monthly men's prayer meeting and why we have a, 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 a oftentimes we have the certain ladies' activities. That's why we're working with several in a one-on-one -on -one discipleship ministry in order to grow. Why do we do all these things? I'll tell you why. To equip and perfect the saints for the work of the ministry. We do it because God said to. We all have the responsibility, pastor included, to grow in our spiritual lives. 
to grow in our knowledge of the Lord, to be more like Christ. And that's going to manifest itself in several ways, but specifically here, it will manifest itself in the work of the ministry. That's how important, watch this, that's how important it is the church is to God. He gives it as the avenue of which saints can be perfected to do his work. And when this takes place, when this takes place, we're talking about the, the pastors helping perfect the saints, the saints all doing the work of the ministry. Notice what the result is in verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, here it is, for the edifying of the body of Christ. When this takes place, the body of Christ is edified. What does edified mean? It means it's built up. When is the body of Christ, when is God's church built up? When we all do our part. Watch this. Pastor, teacher, perfecting the saints. Saints, work of the ministry. Church, edified, built up. God's way. That's how he builds his church. His body built up. By the way, that's going to show itself in a couple of different ways. It will show itself numerically. It's going to show itself numerically in a lot of different ways. But you can't get around the fact that Acts 2, 41, when they put this into play, the Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them. About 3,000 souls. You can't add unto something if it's not there. And once it's there, you ought to add into it. By the way, that's why we have church membership, to add into the number. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. But it's not just numerically, and I don't even think that's the biggest part of when the church is edified. I believe the body of Christ is edified when individually we all grow spiritually. Amen. Yes, there are going to be other folks that come and join in and be a part of them by all means. But the ones that are here, those that are here, each of us each week should be growing spiritually. May I ask you, are you closer to God today than you were this time last year? Are you more like Christ today than you were last month? Sometimes it's hard to measure that, isn't it? We have a lot of physical measurements. We can measure our height. We enjoy doing that when we're young. The older we get, the less we want to use the scale that measures our weight, right? But those are ways that we can physically measure growth. How do we spiritually measure it? We're going to see a measure in just a moment. But... As simply put and as practical as we can have, verse number 12, the saints are perfected as they do the work of the ministry. Here's the unfortunate part, and then we'll go to verse 13 and be done. Unfortunately, too many Christians, follow me here, are content with showing up to church when it's convenient, are content with listening to a sermon as long as they're entertained, are content with throwing some money in the plate here and there, and merrily go on their way for the week, having done their spiritual part. Some Christians would even shop around for a church that can offer them and their family something, like it's a Costco membership or something. God did not intend for his church to offer you something. God intended for you to offer something to his church. Amen. That's how he builds it. It's not about what's in it for me. It's about what has God done for me that I can do for him and his church. Amen. Christian, may I encourage you? Each time you're in God's house, let the Lord fill you up with his food, with his meat, with his water and life. And then throughout the rest of that week, let him squeeze that out of you as you pour it into other people's lives. You can't just sit there and take it all in. Christian, man, I encourage you. The more you just sit and soak, the more will sour. God doesn't want his word poured into our lives so we can just sit there and fill up. Oh, he wants to squeeze us out in the lives of other people. He wants to use what he's doing in our hearts for the purpose of building and edifying his church. It's so much bigger than us. It's about him. The responsibility of the saints who are being perfected. May I ask you, as we're growing in our perfecting of the saints, as we're doing the work of the ministry, 
Whose life are you edifying right now? Who, who, who are you seeing in the church that, hey, maybe they're new to this. Let me, let me be an encouragement to them. Not let me get down on them. No, no, no. Let me show. Let me share my testimony. Let me invite them over. Uh, let me work in this. You, you know, there's that ministry. And he, he was talking about this. And, and I can serve in this way. Hey, I'm not someone special or don't have all the answers. If that's you, join the crowd. That, that's all of us. But, but I can... The Lord's gift to me in this way. How about this? What is it? Each person doing their part for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying the body of Christ. Don't be content with showing up. Join in the work. Let God do his work in you. Let God do his work then through you. And put to use those gifts that he won for you. That was last week when he ascended because he descended to the lower parts of the earth and he won that battle for us to give you gifts. Let's put to use those gifts. That leads us to verse number 13, but don't look down. <laughs> I always lose you when I say that. Verse 11 was what he gave. Verse 12 is why he gave it. Verse 13 is how long that lasts. When do I, when am I perfected? When do I reach the goal? When do I finally get to check that off my list for life? Well, let's look at the first few words of verse 13. It says, till we all come. I'm going to back up here for a moment. If our question is, when do I reach the goal? It's the wrong question to begin with. Because it's not about you, it's about all of us. Amen. That's why we all must work together. That's why we all must be unified in one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one God and, and one spirit and one body. Why? Because it's about all of us till we all come. We all have a responsibility. May I remind you to the body? Because when one part of the body isn't working, it affects the whole body. Helping others as we grow in him. So we all come. And then there are three uh, d descriptions of that time. In this verse, let's look at it. Till we all come, first of all, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Second one, we could say till we all come unto a perfect man. Third one, till we all come unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. May I tell you my first response, reaction when I read that? I got a ways to go. <laughs> Anybody else with me on that? Maybe if you've already reached that goal, uh, I got a lot to learn from you. We, we, we all have a ways to go in each of these words, the word in and unto and unto, carry with it a, a, a certain destination, a definite goal, something to aim at. Look right here. What are you aiming at in your Christian life? If we know we need to draw closer to Christ this week than we were last week, so what are we aiming at? We have a goal here. Did you, under, you understand that when you aim at nothing, you hit it every time? We all get that. And yet, as Christians, how many of us are just mindlessly wandering through our Christian life, hoping to do good things every once in a while? We're aiming at nothing. We have a goal here. And yet, may I, oh, I wish I could just preach a whole message just on this point and I'm sure we will at one time or another this is not something that you and I work at attaining the moment we burden ourselves with all the things that we must do we've done exactly that we burdened ourselves and now it's religion may I tell you something that I'm against religion religion is, is a burdening of me trying to get to God and even as a Christian, even with the best intentions of mine, I can be burdened down with the weight of, I got to do this and don't do this. You see, in this whole passage, it's bigger than this. It's now simply letting God do his work through his man and his spirit, showing us his word, having his way in his children, utilizing his gifts for his church. Do you see how that's all about him? And it's about his strength. 
And it's about his glory. His church. So let's briefly look at each three of these and then we'll close. Each of these three destinations, the first one says to we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. That faith we've already talked about in verse number five. It's the central truths of the Christian faith. God says we reached a good point when there is a foundation of God's word being the gospel and a spiritual unity. Watch this. That's not a structural unity. It's not something that we structure and try to figure out. No, no, it's scriptural unity. It's we preach what thus saith the Lord and we all agree with God's word. This is a doctrinal unity. It's not a unity for the sake of being one. It's a unity of, for the sake of loving and obeying and understanding and following God's word. Teaching and preaching God's word brings that. You know what I dare say? Oftentimes in a place where there's no unity, it may be, just maybe, because God's word isn't being preached and taught clearly. Now, there are certainly a lot of other reasons why it could be, and yet when we preach and teach God's word, there will be doctrinal, scriptural unity. That's why two Christians who may not have known each other last week, and yet this week can have hearts that are bonded together because they both share a desire for God's word and an understanding of God's word. And God does something. What is it? The unity of the faith. And what's at the heart of that unity? The unity of the faith of the knowledge of the son of God. Jesus is. May I ask you this morning? Do you know Jesus? Not do you know about him. All of us probably have a favorite athlete that we know, a favorite team, maybe a favorite actor, whatever this. You know about them, but I dare say no one in this room really knows them. We know a lot of information. Maybe we study this, we've seen this, we know this, we know that, but we don't know them. And unfortunately, in many churches today, we've got a lot of Christians that know a lot about Jesus. They don't know him. I'm not asking, do you have an informational knowledge? I'm talking about, do you have a personal, intimate, relational knowledge? How can you know him? That only happens if you're with him. You can't know somebody you're not with. Simply put, I shared this with the teenagers on, on Friday night. You know, when Jesus called his disciples, there were two things he called them to in Mark 3, 13 and 14. He says, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him. First thing. And that he might send them forth to preach. We focus a lot on that second call and what I do for God. And yet God said, the first thing I want you is to be with me. Christian, you're a human being, not a human doing. Have you been with Jesus lately? You know those 12 disciples? Fearful, <laughs> um, backward, some of them. Uh, didn't have much to offer. Certainly didn't have a lot of knowledge. Most of them were fishermen. That they, were doing that they weren't high on the scale of the law. And yet just a few short years after Jesus left in Acts, the, the other men were looking at them and saying, they, they're unlearned and ignorant men. And yet, these have turned the world upside down. How in the world can 12 men, one who was a devil himself, how can 11 men turn the world upside down if they don't know a lot? I'll tell you how, because they were with Jesus. They were with him for three years. They were with him when he ate. They were with him when he slept. They were with him when he saw him go with his father. They were with him when he helped people, when he loved people. They were with him when he made decisions, and they were with him when he did this, and they were with him when he did that. And though they may not have had a lot of knowledge in man's eyes, simply being with Jesus turned them into people who turned the world upside down. Acts 4 tells us they were looking at Peter and John. They're unlearned and ignorant men, but they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So we all come in the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God.
Can other folks tell you've been with Jesus? Remember Moses, after he met with God on the mount, he came down and the people couldn't even look at him. He was just glowing. It had been a veil over him. It was evident he had been with Jesus. Christian today, oh, may that be the place we get to. Spend some time with Jesus. Paul said in Philippians 3.10, he said, my goal, that I may know him. I know we've got to finish, but let me just tell you one more part about this. The scripture says one way we can know is so anti-culture of the day. You ready for this? It says, be still and know that I'm God. When's the last time you were still? For more than five seconds. This awkward silence part, is it awkward for you? Now, it may be in a group setting, but how about individually? So many people today just can't sit alone with their thoughts in the Lord. Right. Got to have music playing. Got to have this. Got to have this going on. This entertaining. This happening. Got to have headphones. Got to have this. No wonder we can't be with Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. He's a still small voice. He wants to be with you. Pastor, what does this have to do with our whole message? I'm not sure. Got off on that a little bit, but it is in this context of God gives pastors and teachers to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And, and the result of that is we come in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God. What's the next measurement? It says that we come into a perfect man. The word perfect means complete or, or mature. This is describing an adult, not a child. In the faith. The contrast is the next verse, which we're going to look at next week. Look at it, verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. We ought not to be someone that hears something. Ooh, that's a shiny red apple. Let me go that direction. Ooh, what did that preacher say on TV that sounds really good? No, no, no. We ought not to be tossed about, carried about with every wind of doctrine. We ought to come into a perfect man, a mature man, individually and corporately as a church, a mature church in the Lord, building up one another. We're not looking around at somebody and think, oh, look what they did this week. I can't believe that. Look what they're wearing today. Can you believe what they said online? No, no, no. Instead, it's a come alongside and let me help you. Let me encourage you. Let me edify you. Let me build you up into a perfect man. And then the last measurement, it says, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's the measuring rod here? Watch this. It's not other Christians. You ever done that before? Well, you know, I'm not everything I should be. I'm a whole lot better than them. I'll tell you what. We only measure amongst those that will make us look good. And yet God says the measure is the stature of the fullness of Christ. Our one and only standard is Jesus. Watch this. The goal is for others to look at us and see him. After all, it is called the body of Christ. And when folks look at a church and don't see Jesus, how are they the body of Christ? So how can folks look at us and see him? Well, we can just go about it his way. We can have spiritual leadership that will feed the flock, care for, protect, oversee, be mature in, but feed the flock. Why? To perfect the saints. Why do the saints need to be perfected for the work of the ministry? What happens when the saints are perfected and doing the work of the ministry? It's the edifying of the body of Christ. How long does that go till we all come in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God? Till we all come into a perfect man? Till we all come into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Christian, today, 
Are you taking full advantage of every opportunity to be perfected? This is the way you're going to be perfected. All throughout this week, he wants to perfect you in his word. We do our best as a church to offer opportunities. We don't have all the answers, but I can guarantee you when you come to a church service, you're going to be fed God's word. Mm -hmm. Then, Christian, if you're being perfected, are you using what the Lord has gifted you for his church? Or are we sitting and soaking? We all, all of us, myself certainly included, we all have a ways to go. So instead of thinking, I'm so far away from what I need to be, I just give up. Instead of thinking, look how far I've got to go. Here's what I want us to think. What's the next step? And let's take that. Let's take that step this week. Let's take that step today. And next week as we look back, let's take that next step. And as a Christian, we'll take that next step. That's why we're completely redoing some things that we're doing on Thursday nights. Because I want each of us to understand what the next step is. We have times that we're going to do certain studies. Coming soon to a church near you. Uh, certain groups that we're going to before. Certain teams. You ready for this? Ministry teams. Opportunities to serve. Opportunities to put to use in different ways. What God has gifted me for his church. Why? The purpose is edifying in the body of Christ. We want to let God build his church his way. Christ and his church. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer this morning. Thank